Our scripture today will be coming from Daniel chapter 3, verses 13 to 18, and then from 1 Peter 3, verse 14. I talked, uh, just mentioned Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego last week, and this week I'm going to preach on them. So, uh, but before we read, let us pray. Lord, we ask as we read your word that you would bless its understanding to our hearts. And Lord, that we would be doers as well as hearers of it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Daniel chapter 3, verses 13 to 18. And I'll be reading from the version called The Message, which is a kind of a paraphrase. Furious, King Nebuchadnezzar ordered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be brought in. When the men were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar asked, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? that you don't respect my gods and refuse to worship the gold statue I've set up. I'm giving you a second chance, but from now on, whenever the band strikes up, you must go to your knees and worship the statue I have made. If you don't worship it, you will be pitched into a roaring furnace, no questions asked. And who is the God who can rescue you from my power? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king Nebuchadnezzar, your threat means nothing to us. If you throw us in the fire, the God we serve can rescue us from your roaring furnace or from anything else you might cook up, O king. But even if he doesn't, it wouldn't make a bit of difference. We still wouldn't serve your gods or worship the golden statue you have set up. And then from 1 Peter 3, verse 14, But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be unto God. There were three generals at a NATO troop exercise watching their troops, and they were bragging on how brave their troops were. And so the American commander said, well, I'll show you how brave our troops are. And he called a soldier over and said, Soldier, I want you to run to the top of this three-story building and jump off saluting and singing the national anthem. <laughs> so the soldier did it without a second thought, ran, ran out the building, jumped off the building saluting. And the German soldier, the German general said, well, yes, that's very brave, but let me show you what bravery really is. So he called one of his soldiers over and ordered him to fill his pockets full of rocks till he could barely walk. And he said, then I want you to go swim across that big river and sing the German national anthem as you go. So without a second thought, the German did that. He loaded his pockets with rocks, and the last anybody saw him before the bubbles came up was him swinging and swimming across and, and singing. The British commander said, well, yes, those are very brave, but let me show you true bravery. So he called forward a British soldier, and he said, I want you to go jump off this cliff over here. And he said, it's almost certain death. There are jagged rocks at the bottom of it, but I want you to jump off saluting and singing God Save the Queen. And the British soldier looked at him and said, are you crazy? If you want to do that, go jump off it yourself, you old bird. <laughs> and the general looked at the other generals and said, now that's bravery. <laughs> it was actually something in the old British army they used to do. Whenever somebody needed uh, some sort of punishment, they would send them to the sergeant major, who was a fierce person that no one wanted to cross. They would send them to the sergeant major with orders to insult him. And so they had to go and insult the sergeant major who would then put them through all sorts of punishments for whatever. So uh, that's bravery, I guess. But uh, we'll be talking about bravery a little bit today with Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. There's a saying that says that the opposite of bravery is not cowardice, but conformity. And I guess in many ways that is true. If you look at the Third Reich, you could not call the average German a coward. But they were not brave in the sense that they didn't stand up to what was evil. They merely conformed to the system, even though many of them knew that it was evil. The truly brave in that sort of situation were folks like Sophie Scholl and her brother, uh, who were Christians who stood up against the regime and uh, who lost their lives in doing so. In today's passage, uh, which happens after the, the exile of the Jewish people, the Babylonians, if you remember, when they defeated the Israelites, exiled the Jewish people, the bulk of them, all across their empire, put little pockets of them here and there, scattered them out among the pagan peoples of their empire, hoping that they would 
lose their Jewishness and assimilate into being Babylonians. But they took the best and the brightest, particularly of the young people, wanting to use their skills for themselves. And they brought them to the capital and changed their names, the Babylonian names, trained them up in uh, their own ways of using things, gave them cushy jobs, hoping that they too would assimilate and become good Babylonians. In this passage, we meet three young men who uh, had been Hebrews, and their real names were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Each of these names in Hebrew honors, of course, the Hebrew God, the God of Israel. But they had their names changed by the Babylonians to Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, names which honored the pagan gods of Babylon. And then they put them to work in their system. And since they proved to be wiser and smarter than the native Chaldean wise men, they were placed in high positions directly in the service of the king, so much so that the king even knew them on a first name basis. And this made the Chaldeans jealous, as we'll see in a minute. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego did their jobs really well, uh, as long as it didn't impinge on their beliefs, because they still followed the one true God of Israel and lived according to his word. And all went well until the king of Babylon instituted a new rule. The king of Babylon built a huge statue made of gold. It's estimated that you could see it from 13 miles away at that height. And it was called an image. We don't know what it was an image of, but being called an image uh, meant that it was a religious representation of something, some pagan deity concept, maybe even the king himself. But being an image and being told to worship it flew directly in the face of God's commandments not to worship images, to worship only God. And so the king ordered that whenever his instruments would play certain times during the day, everyone was to bow down and worship this image. And if they did not, he said they would be thrown into a burning, fiery furnace. Now the burning, fiery furnace was probably one of the kilns that they had around Babylon. They were doing a lot of building in that day and needed a lot of bricks. And they used the kilns to make bricks. And they were large, huge ovens that you could throw somebody into. And that was going to be the punishment for not worshiping this idol, was to be burned alive in one of those. And so it went. The music played, and people bowed down to worship the idol. Everybody except for Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. They refused to bend the knee to this idol, as they would only worship the God of Israel. And somebody noticed. You know, there's always somebody noticing. Uh, they all should have been face down worshiping, but somebody was people. <laughs> they were looking around to see what everybody else was doing. And there's always somebody like that. And so word got to the Chaldeans about what was going on, and they saw a chance to vent their jealousy. The Chaldeans who held positions like soothsayer and astrologer and court magician and people like that, who hated these three, went to the king and acting all solicitous, like they really cared about the king's feelings, they said, these three Jews, and they called them out as Jews, they said, these three Jews aren't worshiping the golden image that you've set up. You know, they often basically are saying, why are you allowing these men that you've put in such high positions, that you've given so much to, uh, they don't even respect you or your gods to, enough to bow down. Uh, I don't know why you allow them to disrespect you like this. And so the king got all worked up into a self-righteous fury and called Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego in. And he asked them, is it true that you don't serve my gods or bow down and worship the image that I've made? And in essence, he says, I don't answer uh, I'll give you a second chance. You know, he doesn't give them a chance to answer. He says, from now on, whenever you hear the music, if you bow down and worship the image like you're supposed to, then everything will be fine. But if you don't, then I'm afraid I'll have to follow through and throw you in a fiery furnace. And what God is able to deliver you from out of my hand in that case? Well, unexpectedly for the king, who thought he was being very generous here, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego answered basically by saying, there's no need to even go to that point, King. There's no need to see what we do. For if that's the way it's going to be, so be it. Our God, the God of Israel, is able to deliver us out of your hands in answer to your question. But even if he chooses not to, 
We will not bow before the image of the gods that you worship. Now, that's an amazing faith, isn't it? Not only to not conform, <coughs> to not bow, but to tell the king to his very face that you are not going to bow. To witness to the king that we serve a God who can rescue us, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down anyway. Certainly here the words of the Apostle Paul that we read this morning resonate when he says, but even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear and do not be intimidated. Well, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego did not fear what everyone else around them feared and they were not intimidated. They did not fear the king or his power or his threats. They did not fear bucking the crowd and being different and not conforming. They didn't even fear the greatest possible difficulty, which would be their imminent death. And they were not intimidated like everyone else around them by any threats, no matter how extreme or realistic they may have been. They stood up for what was right, despite the possible cost. And in a sense, that is what we remember this weekend as we memorialize Memorial Day, remember that. We recognize people who stood up for what was right, even though it could and did cost them everything even their very lives. And most of these men and women that we remember, if they could speak to us from the grave, they would say more than likely what their still living comrades say when they're asked about it. No, we're not heroes. We're not heroines. We were just doing our duty. But that's the extraordinariness of it, isn't it? Ordinary people doing extraordinary things by doing what is right, regardless of what the cost may be. And so may God bless their memories among us. There's an old saying that says that a hero is somebody who is braver than everybody else for just a moment longer. And you know that's true. Uh, a hero is not somebody who is totally without fear. Somebody who is completely fearless is crazy because it is normal for a human to feel fear. In fact, uh, my brother was a military psychiatrist a military psychiatrist will not let somebody who is fearless anywhere near the battle line because they are a danger to themselves and everyone else. They are truly crazy. It is human to feel fear. So being brave means to do what is right despite the fear. And we have a great many opportunities in our lives to be brave from both the very simple all the way to the simple line. Instead of going along and doing what everyone else does, swallowing our morals, getting along to get along with our heads down, we have opportunities aplenty to stand up and do what is right. The question is, do we take those opportunities? In our Bible study the other evening, we were studying the passage about Deborah, who was a judge and prophetess of Israel, and she called the tribes of Israel to defend themselves. <coughs> But not all the tribes came. Some didn't answer the question at all. And others, like Reuben, it was said, had great resolve in their hearts. They worried in their hearts about it. And they were like those folks that stand around when something right needs to be done and say, yeah, you know, that's right. You're right. And they're behind you all the way. They're way behind you <laughs> when the time comes. And that's what Reuben did. They didn't go. They had it in their heart they wanted to go, but they didn't go. And so to speak what is true and what is right is necessary and good, but it has to be followed by action, standing up and doing what is right. Otherwise, they're just empty words, like Reuben's faithless heart. Like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, we know that our God is able to deliver us. He can deliver us, and no doubt in our lives we can go back and see where he has. But even if it be the will of the Lord that we are to perish in doing what is right, let us resolve, like them, not to bow down and not to conform to what is wrong. Well, in this passage, of course, God did deliver Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. They were thrown into the fiery furnace. <coughs> Where it was noticed, a fourth being was walking around in there with them. Someone who was said to be like the Son of God himself protecting them 
from the flames. And so the king, amazed as he was, had them pulled out of the furnace, and not even a hair on their head or a thread on their, on their outfits was singed. And it said not even the smell of smoke was on them. When God does something, God does it right. We live in a world that demands that we conform. It wants us to respond to the names it gives to us and forces us to bow. And if we do that, the world tells us all will be okay. But if we don't, the fiery furnace is prepared. But we too serve the same God who has shown that he loves us so much that he has given himself for us. The same God who loved Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego also loves and cares for us. And so just as our God saved them, our God can save us. But we love him so much that we should be able to say, even if he doesn't, we still yet will follow him. And that is whatever his purpose may be for us. We will stand and not bow to the idols of the age. Let us not forget Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, who never forgot their God, and whose God did not forget them. They may be known as Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego to everyone else, but in their hearts, and to the God who made them, they will always be Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, who God made them to be. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for making each of us as you have made us, for you make no mistakes. We are each who we are and where we are for your given purpose. Lord, help us to be who you have called us to be, not to fear what the rest of the world fears or to be intimidated as the rest of the world may be in following what it commands, but following only you and your command. For Lord, we know that you love us so much so that you gave yourself for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.